I'd actually just like to uh, uh, thank the previous speakers because they've said a lot of things that I think are really, really useful. Because as Julia said, the first time through um, is the toughest time. It gets better after that, uh, like most things. But um, for my course, um, New Media Literacy, uh, I was one of the first go-rounds when the call came out to set up online courses. I thought this is a great opportunity to generate a completely new course with the idea of it being online from the beginning, rather than take a course that already existed and try and uh, onlineify it, uh, so to speak. I had, I won't get into it, but way back in, in ancient history in the late 20th century when I was a grad student, I was involved with a very early attempt at an online course, and it was a meaningless nightmare of suffering, right? <laughs> it was awful. It was too early to do that kind of thing. Uh, folks, some of you may remember something called Usenet, Listserv, uh, email, uh, stuff like that. The course was a lecture that was an, an, a, a website in progress that was being generated. We were policing participation in email and listserv groups. It, it was god awful. So when uh, the, the, the idea was dangled in front of me that you could do an online course, I thought I have a really good example of what I'm not going to do, right? So what I kind of like to do is begin a course uh, uh, where possible with a problem that needs to be solved. Right? So one of the problems I identified that I thought would be really good for an online course was the fact that students, we think they're tech gurus, but they're not. They're really good at Facebook. They're really good at watching YouTube. They're pretty darn good at World of Warcraft. But they're not actually the tech gurus we believe them to be. They grew up in a generation where it was all very easy, right? Everything is a touch of a button, the move of a, of a mouse. Some of us are actually more tech guru-like uh, than they are because we grew up in a time uh, when we had to do a lot more in order to use computers. It was a more difficult task. And that's one thing I think we kind of forget. Um, and it's something I encountered in my teaching in, in com, pop, culture, and film. And I was rather amazed that they weren't that skilled. I assumed they were way more skilled than they were. So I thought, what I'm going to do is I'll create a course that gets them to learn new media literacy skills, right, to use these things. That comes out of my frustration as someone who teaches tech and culture kind of stuff with the fact that we have an incredible assemblage of technologies at our disposal now now that we don't use. Uh, it's been turned into the internet, the web, all this kind of stuff. Social media has been turned into a technology of consumption rather than of production. Again, back in the late 20th century, everyone thought, wow, now everybody's going to be a documentary film producer. Everybody's going to be an online journalist. Everyone's going to have their voices heard online because we have access to this. What we're actually doing is telling people that we just went to the bathroom and we're watching uh, uh, YouTube, like water skiing squirrels and stuff like that on YouTube. So I thought this, this situation needs to be rectified. So that was the impetus to start the course. So, hey. Oh. Hey, yeah. So uh, the idea was to encourage uh, uh, production, community, and advocacy over consumption, isolation, and apathy. That's probably when people think about online culture, if they critique it, it's the idea that it is consumption alone and you don't really care about anything else. So I'm trying to turn that on its head. Jeez. <laughs> so because we could do it from the ground up, we decided uh, to try and throw out, so to speak, uh, uh, ways of thinking about uh, course delivery that were traditional, uh, proximal relations, you know, in a space designed, Foucault would tell us, to police uh, 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 learning. So we kind of hit upon, and I have to thank Matt, Mike, uh, Mark wasn't there at the time, uh, and Julia in particular. Um, I see this course as a co-production. It really is a group effort. And uh, if you people are thinking about doing something like this, these folks are, are your best friends. They're absolutely incredible. And actually, I'm going to give them a little round of applause right now. Because none of this could happen without these guys. So uh, really, Julie and I kind of hit on the idea of using uh, blogging as the foundation for the course, right? Um, so that we would try and generate what we later called a community of learning, which just sounds lovely. Uh, so that was, the, I'm going to talk more about the blogs later on. But everything in the course was put um, and just in text form. I didn't use videos and things like that. Um, it was just all text-based. The idea was to get the course into uh, or, or to have the course be delivered almost by the students in a way uh, through interaction using the very media that they were reading about and critically analyzing uh, as, as they were doing the course. So we divided them up originally, um, not according to a seminar per se, you know, A to B in group one or whatever it might be, but uh, we came up with some categories. You can see here there's arts and music, economy and labor, education, environment, areas we thought students would be interested in regardless of what 
the course was about, the new media literacy skills. So if you had an interest in the outside world, so to speak, in one of these areas, we started grouping them. Pick a topic within these areas. You'll see why that's important a little bit later on. Um, and we had, I think in the end, we had about 12 or 15, I can't remember. It changed as the course size changed, obviously. So these folks would then become, in essence, their own seminar within these groups. They each had a particular topic that they would blog about on occasion, as I'll describe later. But they would be accessing one another's blogs, replying to one another's postings, uh, summarizing the, po the replies of others to their posts. So they would post and someone, you know, they get four, five, six, eight comments back. They would have to then take those comments, integrate them in a response and say, now that I've heard all this about what you guys said about my post, I now think this, I changed my mind, I didn't, whatever it might be. So that's how the community kind of formed. That's also how we managed to get out of having to police participation. That was my biggest fear because in that course, it was a nightmare. I ended up looking at literally five 5,000 individual items to just make sure they were, I didn't design the course, I got stuck being a TA in it. Uh, so it, it was a nightmare. So this way we figured it becomes a community. They're interacting rather than all saying something to me as an instructor or a bunch of TAs and then us saying, okay, check, 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 kind of thing, right? Which stultifies discussion more or less. Uh, okay, so thanks. Um, so I'm going to go through the, uh, the assignments basically, the skill set that they came out of the course with. Uh, this will be relatively speedy, I hope. Um, so we did blogs, obviously the core of the course, I'll talk about that a bit more. They made a video, um, they analyzed Wikipedia, uh, they created a podcast, and they engaged in a little bit of online journalism as well in the course. Um, so the blogs, as I said, it was the foundation for the course. Uh, seemed to work very well. Some of the students, because it was on just an open blogging platform, they used WordPress or Blogger, uh, whatever it may be, they would actually get some responses to their coursework from the outside world. And the excitement that they uh, displayed in having that experience was really something to see. Some of the kids actually maintained their blogs after the course ended um, in their interest group, in the, or not their interest group, but their interest area. So if they had an interest in the environment, they would continue blogging about that particular uh, 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 topic after the course. Um, so this is an example of one student's blog. Uh, you can use any blogging platform that you want. The way it tended to work, I did it in modules. It would be a three-week module for each sort of skill that they were learning. So they would read, um, for example, the podcast. I've done different things because the course has been offered a few times. Um, but in the podcast, they would read articles about the music industry, digital piracy, copyright issues, and then produce a podcast on those issues, right? And you'll see that in a second. Um, but they would also, before they did that, that was the final task in the module. Um, what they would do before then is they would read the readings that were assigned, and then they would, I would give them a guiding question uh, of some sort that usually integrated their, ask them to put themselves into the scenario they were reading about. So if they were reading about online digital piracy or something, BitTorrent, all that kind of stuff and its effect on the music industry, it was consider your practices in relation to online copyright piracy. Where do you stand, right? Are the labels really hosing you and it's your God-given right to steal music or are you hosing the artists when you're stealing their music and you know you've all done it? What do you feel about that? So I was trying to get them, because they were blogging, it's not an essay that they're writing per se in this course, it's a skill-based course, um, but to put themselves into the issue uh, kind of thing. That tends to get more engagement out of the students in this particular scenario. Um, so the video, this one, I think uh, Julia can attest to, we, we had the biggest freak out uh, uh, from the students about, oh my God, how can I possibly make a video? I have no access to special effects, explosions, uh, digital, I like, how can I do that, right? Their, their vision of what, they, of what they thought we would expect of them was way high. The amateur video works, right? You, you would have done well in the course. Uh, so they, they freaked out about that, but the thing was, we didn't help them a whole lot. Maybe that was me. Um, but it was, you know what, we're not gonna do a video tutorial telling you how to do it. What you have to do is go there and just play around with it. You've got smartphones, you've got cameras that have video, all that kind of stuff, shoot stuff, put it up on the online editor, Mozilla, the folks who bring you Firefox also have an online video editor called Popcorn. Um, put it up on Popcorn and just goof around with it for a while until you get a feel for it. Right? So we wanted to encourage them to just kind of stumble and fumble. And the whole idea was it doesn't matter what kind of quality it is. What matters is that you discuss the topic that is of interest to you, make a video about it, and begin to think in a visual way about trying to present those ideas related to your issue. The end product is the fact that you did it, right? that you got over that hump 
of feeling like, oh my god, I can't possibly do this, and just do it, right? Yeah, patent pending or whatever. That's Nike's term. Um, the next thing we did was an analysis of the talk page, the sort of backside, might not be the best word, uh, the backside of, of Wikipedia, every site. Uh, this one is the War of 1812. It has a discussion section where all of the people who are contributing to it um, talk amongst themselves and say, I think we should include this. No, you're crazy. We shouldn't. Hey, this fact is wrong. Oh my God, you're an American and you're trying to speak for Canadians. Blah, 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 blah. It's a really, really active page. There's also conveniently an article, a really good article, that was written about the sort of evolution of this talk page and the back and forth, the discourse and debate and all that kind of stuff. So they looked at uh, this and they could also, in a later iteration of the course, they could pick something that was in their interest area and look at them discussing what should or shouldn't be included uh, on that wiki entry. Um, and then they did an op-ed article, basically, um, uh, discussing the validity of the knowledge that they find on Wikipedia. The result of that is that most of them were rather amazed to discover the care and concern that goes into Wikipedia entries. Um, but that's a, different, uh, that's a different story altogether. Um, they did the podcast. This was second, I guess, to the oh my god uh, moment of the video project. Uh, we got a lot of uh, students freaking out about this one at the beginning, but because we'd done the video thing, they were more inclined to take a shot at it. They did, and, and some of them did a really, really good job. Uh, it was quite professional. Um, again, this can be done easily online. We use all freely available online tools for this. So there's no kind of fee. Um, really straightforward kind of stuff as well, easy to learn. Um, there are all kinds of tutorials online. The sites themselves, SoundCloud will tell you kind of how to put this thing together. So it's all there already, so you don't have to sweat bullets about um, having to come up with tutorials that you then have to put online in order to get them to do this kind of stuff. Um, and again, they, well, you can see learning disabilities. Um, uh, that was their uh, topic of interest uh, in that particular case. So again, they would read about uh, uh, articles related to copyright sound, uh, audio on the, on the web and all that kind of stuff. But their final project, which was posted to their blog, would be uh, a podcast about their area of interest. Um, online journalism, there's a really, really cool uh, uh, tool out there called Storify. If you haven't run into it, it's, it, it's pretty darn cool. Um, you can take pretty much anything from the web, Facebook posts, Twitter uh, feeds, uh, images, YouTube videos, any content that's on the web, you can slot it into here. And uh, again, using their interest uh, area, uh, they created a, a, a piece of journalism about an issue of concern to them. But they could bring in all these other sources, video from CNN, whatever it might be, anything that was out there on the web, they could assemble it together and engage in this kind of online journalism um, and advocacy, really, uh, in the end. Uh, yeah, so just to sum it up, we've, uh, I don't know where I am time-wise, but um, we've offered it five times now, uh, uh, this course, so uh, from the very beginning, the first go-round of the online courses. Um, it's proven to be crazy popular. Uh, we have it set at about 300 people at the moment, 300 students. Um, we could take more, but we don't have uh, the TAs to, to, to do the grading work and all that kind of stuff. We're basically limited by resources at the moment. Um, I actually designed it to be very scalable. So I, I thought early on, if this thing gets bigger, we could take 3,000, we could take 30,000, really, in this. Um, as it scales up, you basically, I've got a bit of a ratio of uh, marker graders for a lot of, most of the marker grading assignment stuff. It's fairly straightforward, the podcast and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then a teaching assistant for uh, interaction with the students, because as it starts getting bigger, you can't answer all those emails. That's when you get into that 5,000 individual items kind of scenario. Um, so we add a teaching assistant for about, we're playing with the numbers. It, it ends up being about 70 students or so. As 70 get on, we add on a teaching assistant. Their job isn't to grade anything. That's the marker grader's job. Um, that's about every 100 students or so uh, we add on a marker grader. Um, but the teaching assistant is for interaction. So they will actually also go in and post little replies to the blog. So if you add on a few of these teaching assistants, you can have them going in and kind of encouraging the students to stay engaged by having them post uh, on their blogs, as well as answering emails, discussion forum, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, all in all, I would say it's been a fabulous experience. Um, the main thing I would say about it is that it, it, it made me completely rethink not just how I teach, but why I teach and, and what I want to teach. Um, 
what happens when you're doing this is you have to deliver it in a different way, right, if you're moving online. Um, you're not comfortable with it necessarily, you haven't done it before, um, and that actually turns out to be great. Um, I was as terrified as the kids who had to make the video, I was like, oh my god, what am I going to do, an online course? Um, but with the encouragement of the CPI folks, I just fiddled around with it, did some stuff, and now I find when I'm teaching and putting courses together, instead of thinking about the content, which I still think about, obviously, um, but I'm thinking about what's my goal? Why am I doing this course? What, what's in it for the student? What, what does the student need to get out of this course? Not just in terms of the content, but the experience, and am I meeting them in that, that halfway point? So having to jump outside of, of your kind of uh, comfort zone, so to speak, uh, at least for me, has been a fabulous experience that has made me, uh, it's reinvigorated my teaching. I'm way more excited about it um, than I ever was before. It, it just seems like a great thing to do and I'm constantly now thinking about how can I change things in all my other courses. Um, and yeah, it's been great. And again, CPI folks. <laughs> Thanks.